Hello again, everybody. Uh, so here we're going to talk about some of the drugs that we use in hypertension, and there are a lot. So for that reason, I've divided this uh, topic up into two videos, and there are more drugs for hypertension even than we're going to talk about. Um, but I want to focus on the ones that you're likely to run into on the exam, and I would say 95% of the time in clinical practice, uh, if you're dealing with hypertension, you will be dealing with one of these drugs that we'll talk about either in this first part or in the second part. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you uh, who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so these are our drugs that are relevant to hypertension. There are a lot. There are some we're not going to go over, one of those being phenoldepam. Um, I don't want to go into that because it's not very commonly used. You can look that up on your own. It's pretty low yield. Um, but these drugs you absolutely run into regularly. Um, so it would behoove you to know these drugs. All right, let's start out with our diuretics. And this is why I put it in the nephrology section, although I'm going to take these hypertension videos and I'm going to put it in my cardiology playlist because, you know, this is obviously very relevant to the cardiovascular system. So diuretics are responsible for increasing urinary flow, and there are a number of them. One thing I do want to point out, however, is that they are contraindicated in pregnant patients. Um, remember that uh, in pregnant patients, we always want to avoid diuretics and we want to avoid the RAS inhibiting drugs, which we will get to in a little bit. Okay, so this is our nephron. And if you've watched some of my pre previous videos, you will have seen uh, this, this diagram before. And so I will highlight uh, the areas uh, where each of these drugs work. Loop diuretics. So the main loop diuretic is furosemide. We give this drug all the time, Lasix. Um, and so uh, this uh, is a diuretic that is sulfa-based. So keep that in mind. Lots of people have allergy to sulfa, including yours truly. Um, so you'd want to avoid these drugs in a patient who has a sulfa allergy. This these drugs are very useful in patients who are fluid overloaded. So whether that be pulmonary edema, whether that be pitting peripheral edema, whether it be congestive heart failure, um, loop diuretics are really, really good for that. Some of the adverse effects include hypokalemia. Why? Because it blocks this receptor here, this NKCC receptor. And so what happens is that you have extra potassium in your filtrate and uh, also extra sodium in your filtrate. And when you have that extra sodium, your body is going to reabsorb some of that sodium and it'll kick out potassium. So you're kind of losing potassium in two ways. So these patients will be at risk for hypokalemia. Of course, hypotension can always develop anytime you're giving some, somebody something that is going to cause them to lose volume. Gout attacks can happen as well. Nephrolithiasis, why? because loop diuretics decrease the reabsorption of calcium. They can be useful for treating hypercalcemia, but you have all that calcium sitting in your nephron, and certainly it's going to raise your risk of developing calcium-based stones, whether that be calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate. Okay, thiazide diuretics. The big one here is hydrochlorothiazide, very, very, very commonly given for hypertension. Um, Basically, the way this works is, it, is that it inhibits this sodium chloride co-transporter, also called NCC. And so what happens here is that you decrease the amount of sodium that's in these tubular cells. And so that is going to increase this channel here, which pulls sodium out of the blood and into the cells and puts calcium into the blood. So this will actually raise your serum calcium level and decrease the calcium that's in your filtrate. And that has a very important application. 
Now, if you watched my video on hypertension, you'll know that thiazide diuretics is the initial therapy in most newly diagnosed essential hypertension patients, although there are other drugs that we may use in different populations. The major indications, hypertension, heart failure, and then here's the big one that gets commonly tested, nephrolithiasis. We are reducing the amount of calcium in the filtrate. If there's less calcium, you're less likely to form calcium stones. Remember that calcium stones make up the vast, vast, vast majority of uh, kidney stones. It can also be used to treat nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The adverse effects are very, very similar to the loop diuretics, except the loop diuretics raise your risk of developing calcium stones, whereas the thiazide diuretics reduce your risk. Potassium sparing diuretics work at the collecting duct. It inhibits the epithelial sodium channel, also called ENAC, and ENAC pulls sodium out of the tubules. Uh, so if we, if we don't pull sodium out of the tubules, uh, then what's going to happen is we're going to reabsorb more potassium. Okay, if we're reabsorbing more potassium, we're not losing that potassium, and so we don't get the hypokalemia that we would see with the thiazide or the loop diuretics. This is often used as an adjunctive treatment, uh, but it can also be used in mineralocorticoid excess. Remember that excess mineralocorticoids uh, will cause a hypokalemia, so this will help restore the body's potassium or preserve the body's potassium. You can go too far and result in a hyperkalemia. You can also get a metabolic acidosis from this. Um, and as for why that is, you're just going to have to uh, review your renal physiology. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to keep this uh, pretty physiology light here. Don't use this drug in patients with renal failure. They are already predisposed to hyperkalemia. Aldosterone antagonists may also be considered potassium-sparing diuretics. Um, so um, in that instance, uh, what you have is a drug that does not work on this particular channel, uh, but it does work right here. And so if we antagonize this channel, then we're not going to be throwing potassium into the filtrate, and so we will preserve our body's potassium. And meanwhile, sodium will remain in the filtrate, and that's why we still have the diuretic effect. Remember, water follows sodium. Okay, car carbonic anhydrase inhibitors are very, very rarely used for hypertension. As a matter of fact, I've never seen them used for, for hypertension, for, for cardiovascular hypertension. Uh, basically, the way that this works is it reduces bicarbonate reabsorption. That will, because that's an anion, will hold on to sodium and thus water in the filtrate. Some of the sodium will be reabsorbed in the principal cells, but it does have a net uh, natriuretic effect and thus a diuretic effect. Like I said, rarely used for hypertension, but there is a hypertension that it is used in, intracranial hypertension. So look for it there. It is often used in glaucoma and it does have some effect in epilepsy, but possibly the more common place where you're going to use this in the outpatient setting with normal patients. Let's say you're taking a trip to Peru like I did four years ago. Well, uh, you get off that plane, spend a couple days there, you're not going to be feeling too great. This drug is used for altitude sickness prevention. All right, the adverse effects here, because we're losing bicarb, you can get a metabolic acidosis. You can also have hypokalemia. And because what we're doing here is we're alkalinizing the urine, you can get nephrolithiasis. Any of those kidney stones that are more likely to form an alkali filtrate, um, such as the most common stone, the calcium oxalate stone. This is a detailed mechanism of how this works. If you really want to look at it, if you're taking step one, I would suggest that you know this. Step two and three, not so important. Okay, let's get into the RAS inhibitors. So this includes the famous ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, direct renin inhibitors, really just one, and then secubitril valsartan. Um, this drug is becoming more and more commonly used. Expect to see this more and more in the future. Uh, unfortunately, it still is under patent right now. It's called Entresto. That should be an L.
All right, so just a, a preface, RAS inhibitors are generally contraindicated in pregnancy, so do not select these drugs for a pregnant patient who's hypertensive, whether that be gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, what have you, do not go for these drugs. This is the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. You should know this from step one. Uh, if you want to refer to this, you can. Okay, ACE inhibitors. So, so there are various examples, lisinopril, uh, in my experience, that's the most commonly used, but there are a number of others, enalapril, captopril. You may run into this drug called enalaprilat, and that AT at the end kind of throws people off. All that means is that uh, this is an IV formulation. Okay, I don't know if the AT means IV formulation, but if you see enalapril, then that's the PO drug. If you see enalaprilat, that's the IV formulation. Drug works the same way. Mechanism. It blocks the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Remember, that is the angiotensin-converting enzyme. Particularly, this is used in hypertensive patients with evidence of renal disease. It is renally protective. So if you have a patient with newly diagnosed hypertension who is diabetic, make sure you get a urinalysis. If they are peeing out protein, then this is the drug that you would go for because patients who are diabetic and hypertensive, those are two major risk factors for renal disease. Um, sometimes it is used for patients who are diabetic uh, who don't have hypertension, but I'm not sure what the evidence is there. Adverse effect, the big one, most common one is cough. For some people, this is just unbearable, so we can move to a different drug, which you'll see. Angioedema is the most severe adverse effect. This can be life-threatening. Severe hypotension, because this is a, a antihypertensive, that's always going to be a possibility. And then hyperkalemia. Captopril itself can cause neutropenia and can worsen proteinuria. So that may not be the best ACE inhibitor to go for. Contraindications, obviously, if there's a history of angioedema, bilateral renal artery stenosis, remember in that case, activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is what preserves the GFR, so avoid it there. And then, of course, pregnancy. Angiotensin receptor blockers are primarily used when we want to use an ACE inhibitor, but there's either contraindications, excluding pregnancy, in that case we always avoid these drugs, uh, and usually that contraindication is either a history of angioedema or more commonly a cough that the patient just cannot tolerate. And so, like I said, most commonly used in patients who can't tolerate ACE inhibitors. Why are angiotensin receptor blockers uh, better? for patients who can't tolerate ACE inhibitors, when you consider they work very similarly. Well, these drugs, the angiotensin receptor blockers, do not have an effect on bradykinin metabolism. Remember, bradykinin metabolism also uses the ACE enzyme. Um, so by uh, bypassing that and just going straight to blocking angiotensin receptors, uh, then we don't have any effect on the bradykinin metabolism. And that's really what contributes to the cough. And it's also what contributes to angioedema. There are very few adverse effects here, none that you need to know clinically. Contraindications, again, pregnancy and bilateral renal artery stenosis. And you can see here, ACE inhibitors work both on the bradykinin system, which is what causes the cough and the vasodilation that we would see in angioedema, uh, whereas angiotensin receptor blockers only work on the RAS system. Direct renin inhibitors, I don't think you're going to run into these, but it's good to know. Uh, the major one is aliskirin. It's the only one as far as I know. Uh, this inhibits renin, the very first step, and that prevents the conversion of, oh man, I got that wrong, angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. So we're even earlier on in uh, that pathway. It has similar efficacy to the ACE inhibitors and ARBs, but should not be used in patients with a history of heart failure or diabetic complications just because the evidence of its efficacy uh, is lacking there. Adverse effects, uh, pretty much what you would expect with uh, the RAS agents and the uh, some of the diuretics as well. Uh, so look for hypotension, hyperkalemia, 
especially in patients who may have some pre-existing renal insufficiency, elevated uric acid, which can then cause uric acid stones and gout. This is, again, contraindicated in pregnancy, and this is so important, you never use two RAS inhibiting agents together. So you would never use an ACE and an ARB at the same time. Never, ever, ever, ever. You know, and there are many instances in which we do use two antihypertensives, so that's very common. Um, but uh, you would never use two of these drugs at the same time. Secubitril valsartan is the one that I kind of alluded to earlier. So here this is a combined drug, two drugs with two very different mechanisms. Of course, valsartan is an angiotensin receptor blocker, which we already talked about. And secubitril is something called a neprilysin inhibitor. And a ne neprilysin is an enzyme that breaks down natriuretic peptides, which um, are endogenously secreted hormones that uh, will increase uh, the... Uh, loss of water and thus reduce blood pressure. So if we block neprilysin, then those natriuretic peptides uh, that have a natural tendency to cause you to urinate more sodium, um, we're going to have an antihypertensive effect from that as well. So we're coming at it two ways. Now, this is not generally given to patients with just garden variety hypertension. This drug is usually reserved for patients who have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, that being less than 40%. It is the preferred RAS inhibiting agent now for the outpatient management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, but it is not used for hypertension in the absence of heart failure. Again, not to be used in combination with other RAS inhibiting agents. Remember, one of the drugs here is Valsartan. And for more on this drug, you can go to the drugs in congestive heart failure, which is in my cardiology section.